2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to deal with a question tonight. I've, I've asked this question for several years. I mean, as a minister, I've asked God this question. And I believe God's answered it for me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to give you all the points to to the answer to that question. I want to share with you some of the answer to the question I've asked God for several years. Here a few months ago, God got to talking to me and answering a question. You know, sometimes you gotta go a long time before you ever answer your question. But if you'll just be patient, God will get around to it after a while. He don't have to get in a hurry. He don't have a clock on the wall saying, you got to hurry up, this thing's going to run out on you. No, God, he, he is in control of everything. And I've asked God for years, God, why is it that there's some folks that I pray for or others get prayed for, but they don't get healed? Why is it? Why is it some folks stay sick when it looks like they ought to be healed? Now, I, as a minister, have had the devil to put me on a guilt trip Try to make me believe that I was the one of the reason that some folks didn't get healed. And I'm going to show you from the Word of God tonight the answer to that question why some people do not receive the things of God that they, they want or they need. I know James said you ask the miss. That's the reason you don't get it. For some, it's due to the fact of the lack of faith. And I can tell you it's more than that. I said it's more than the lack of faith. I found in this Bible that it's not enough to have faith. You must go beyond that. There's some other things that come into play. I suppose the bottom line is for us to receive the things of God, it's a simple little word, just obey God. That's it. It's so simple that the majority of the church is missing it. God, he's not giving us an option. He is not saying if it's compatible with your lifestyle or if it fits your fancy. But he said to that church, we are to obey God in everything. In all things, we are to obey God's word. And then we shall see the fullness of the word of God manifested in our life. Stand with me for just a few moments as we read from the word of God. I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 5. I want to use this man's life as an example of why some folks don't get from God that that they really should have or that they need. Now the Bible says in chapter 5 and verse 1, Now Naaman, captain the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable because by him the Lord given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he, he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, brought away captive out of the land of Israel, little maids, and she waited on Naaman's wife, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. He departed, took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold, and then change it to raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, When this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh the quarrel against me. It was so. When Elisha, the man that God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me. He shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times. Thou flesh shall come again to thee. Thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. And went away and said, Behold, I thought, listen, I thought he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana 
and far, far rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet said or had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he said to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Our Father tonight, without you there is no cure. You sent your son Jesus, but there's a cure. Jesus, you stood at that whipping post, and you bore the stripes on your back, that man could be healed, that the church could be made well, that we could be set free from our sickness and infirmities. Not only did you stand at the whipping post, God, I have faith in that. I have faith that you went to the cross and you shed your blood, you lay your life down, and you took it up again, and you live today at the right hand of the Father, and you make intercession for your people. I pray, Father, through your Son, by your Spirit, Confirm the word of God in this house tonight. May our faith grow and multiply. May it come to a state of perfection that you may do for us what your word said you're going to do. For I have faith in God in all things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You might be seated. I asked God for ten years. God, why is it that some people are not made whole. Some few months ago, he answered that question for me. I want to share it with you tonight. The Bible tells me in Isaiah 53 and 5 that Jesus himself, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now that's what Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 24. I want you to know tonight, according to the word of God, it is the will of God to heal people. I, I met some folks that say, you know, healing went out with the apostles. They said, you know, it was just after Pentecost that God, he healed people, and he no longer heals people today. And I submit to you tonight, I have discovered in the word of God that it is still God's will to heal. I've seen God heal people just in this revival. So that's a testimony against the lie of the devil that God still heals sick folks. You know, I've learned that I suppose 90% of the church, and you may be able to increase that number to 95%, that probably 95% of the church is sick. In some form or fashion, I would say 95% of the church has some kind of ailment of one fashion or another. But you know what's happened to some people? The devil's brought them to the place to make them believe that they must live that condition. And if he never gets you to say that, or act that way, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. Matter of fact, you will die in that very condition. Now, how many tonight believe there's a cure? The doctor says there is no cure. But you know, the doctor don't have the final say, according to the Word of God, because Jesus Christ is the chief physician. He's the one that bore, our stri bore the stripes for the healing of our body. I was sitting on the platform one night. God got to talk to me. He, he asked me a question. Suppose there was no doctors or medicine. What do you think would happen? Well, I, I, I've got ideas. But you know if there was no doctors or medicine, I don't have a message against doctors or medicine. I, I'm not here to say that tonight because I, I know if it wasn't for doctors, there'd be a lot of dead folks. There'd probably be some of you here tonight. Had it not been for doctors or ministry, some, some kind of, of medication or, or some kind of sophisticated instrument to you, that you would not have lived. I know it's the mercy of God. The doctor, he cannot heal you. It is Jesus that does the healing. But you see, if there was no doctors and if there was no medicines, there would be more deaths. That's just simple. You can figure that out for yourself. But not only would there be more deaths, the second point that really struck my heart and really dug into me is God said there would be more miracles. There would be more miracles because he would put you and I in the position that you can do nothing but trust God. I said you can do nothing but trust God. I, I've been in countries where they don't have 911 to dial. 
I, I've been in countries where they don't have their own doctor by name. They, they don't have an in-church policy that they can turn to and relax in and say, you know, if something happens to one of the kids, and we'll just run them down to the hospital or call the ambulance over to the house, and, and they can carry them to the hospital and, and, and feel comfortable, don't have to worry about the bill. But you see, because that some of these things have come along, it has been an enemy of the faith of God's people. I said it's been an enemy of the faith of God's people. Now, I can tell already some of you are digging in on me. I'm talking about tonight that there is a cure. I said there is a cure for every sickness or ailment. I don't believe that God's got a category that he puts a, a headache over here and, and a brain tumor over there. I don't believe he puts a toe ache over here and leukemia over here. I believe that all of them come of the same heading. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I believe that cancer has to bow to the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that leukemia has to bow to the name of Jesus Christ because he is that almighty healer. Now we have settled on the fact that God can heal all sickness and disease and we've settled on the fact that it is the will of God to heal people, then we must go back to the question, why is it then that some folks are not being healed? I'm talking about in the church. You know, I've seen people, sister, come in off the street, cold turkey, walk into a church and hear a message and childlike faith walk out with a miracle. I, I, I was in, a, in revival. Lady come in with, with a deadly disease. It was a killer disease. The doctors already told her she'd come in the service and God miraculously healed her at the altar that night. Walked out there. The doctors confirmed you don't have it anymore. It's right here. Here it is to prove. Oh, but I want to tell you God wants to make the church well. When Jesus come the first time, the majority of them people were sick. Everywhere he went, that's all he found was sick folk. Not only the fact because they were sinners. I know that sickness come because of sin. And, and, and because we are saints don't mean that we may not get sick either. You hear me? And because you do get sick don't necessarily mean that you committed sin. But on the other hand, it could be the reason that you are sick. I can tell somebody didn't like that now. Now let me use this man Naaman as an example. You got a lot of folks sitting on pews today, just like Naaman. I mean, from the front to the back, you can call them Mr. Naaman sitting there. The Bible said that Naaman was the captain of the host of Syria. He's a great man, the Bible said, great and honorable. He was used by God to deliver. They, they use, him, use him to use the, by, with the Syrians to come against the devil, the enemy. The Bible said he was a mighty man in valor. Oh, everywhere Naaman went, folks knew him. Yes, sir, that's Mr. Naaman there. He's a great fellow. I mean, he, he's a whiz. He's a mastermind when it comes to warfare. Ain't no enemy can stand against him. Well, it was God using him because Israel backslid. But here's this man, Israel, or this man Naaman, rather. The Bible said not all these things about him, but it said he was a leper. Now, that was a dreaded disease. I, I've seen pictures of people that had leprosy. Their, their hands, their fingers, I, I mean literally their arms are right off to the elbows. I thought, how in the world can they stand the pain because I, I see their toes and their feet right off, swell up real big, and, and literally decay away. No, no medication, nothing to help them. Oh, it was a painful disease. It was a crippling disease. And the Bible said that Naaman had this disease. There's no cure for him. I said, there's no cure for that man. Say all the great things you want to about him. He's got something nobody wants. I mean, he's a great man in Syria. But I can tell you on the other hand, there wasn't one of those slaves out there traded places with him. No, sir, not on your life. They look at that man's skin and said, no, sir, he's got leprosy. Let him ride that chair all he wants. I, if I got to have leprosy to ride with him, no, sir, I don't want anything to do with leprosy. Because it was a feared and treated disease, I suppose, like AIDS today is. 
folks are afraid of it. They're, they're, they're scared of it. It's a, it's a killer. And so was leprosy. Here's a man. Everywhere he went, they knew him as a leper. But here this man had went, and he'd brought back captive out of the land of Israel a little la- maiden. This, just a little old Jewish girl. I, I can just picture her. She, she hadn't even become to the age of being a teenager. She's in the house of this man called Naaman. I believe that over in her room where she was appointed to stay, that this little young lady laying there, she could hear the moans and the groans and the cries of Naaman during the dark hours of the night as he would lay in there in pain, as he was suffering because of this killer crippling disease called leprosy. And this little Jewish maid, she waited on Naaman's wife. And I, I can see the comfort in the, uh, this little maid as she would try to give it to that man's wife. And one day that little Jewish maid said to Naaman's wife, Do you know what? That there's a cure for your husband, Naaman. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, young lady. Leprosy, there's no medication that can touch it. There's nothing that can help my husband called Naaman. But she said, I want to tell you something. I would to God that my Lord were with the prophet that is the Samaria. What are you talking about? For he would recover him of his leprosy. There wasn't no question about it. They wasn't no if, hands, or maybes. This little lady, she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man, David, he can be made whole. She said, there is a cure for him. I thought about that little young lady, Mr. Naaman. He had taken her away from her mom and dad. He went down there, brought her away from home. She's living in a foreign land now. Ain't no brothers or sisters, no cousins, aunts and uncles, nowhere around. She's all by herself. I can tell you, you, you take a lot of folks and put them in her condition. They've been trying to retaliate. That's right. They've been trying to get back. Said, bus. Bless God, I'll get you back now. I, I'll show you. And, and, and a lot of folks in the church today would have been laying in the other room uh, laughing. Said, goody, goody, goody. I'm glad all this stuff is happening to him because he brought me away from mom and dad. But not this little girl. She's a, she's a typical Christian little young lady. She has love and concern and compassion, though she lives in a far land. She's concerned about this man called Naaman. Send him to Samaria. There's a man there can hear or heal him. I can see that little mother, that little little wife of his. Boy, she's excited. Can't wait till Naaman gets home that afternoon. Here Naaman comes driving up the front yard in the chariot. He comes in the house, and she says, Guess what, honey? I just discovered today there's a cure for leprosy. Well, I've tried every doctor. Ain't no cure for le- Yes, sir, there's a cure. You s- Come here, honey. T- tell, tell Mr. Naaman what you told me today. Yes, sir, Mr. Naaman. There's a cure for your leprosy. There's a man. He, he is down in Israel. His name is called Elisha. And his, this man can make you whole. Boy, he gets excited. He goes and tells the king about it. The king gets excited because the king cares about Naaman. Naaman's his right-hand man. Because of Naaman, he is now living in victory. And I can see the king. He sits down, gets him a pen, writes out a letter. He said, here, take this. You go to the king of, of Israel. You give him this letter. And I want him to cure you of this terrible disease. Now, I wonder how that little girl found out about Elisha. She's living in captivity. I don't know, maybe before she ever left there. Maybe her mother told her, you know, there's a man to God that lives down the street. I mean, he he, he knows how to touch God. He knows how to get in contact with God. And this little lady never forgot that man called Elisha. The latter gets to the king of Israel. I can see that big boy sitting on that phone, you know. He's sitting up there. That name and hands him that letter. He won't get to read it. Oh, man, his countenance changes. That, that blood runs out of his face. He, he, he's afraid now. He can't believe what he's reading. He, he says here, am I God? What does this man think? Am I God to cure a man of his leprosy? You know what he was saying? There's no cure for leprosy. There's no hope for that man, Naaman. I know what he's up to. He sent him to pick a quarrel with me. I know what he's going to do. He's trying to get some reason for us to go into battle against one another. 
And the Bible tells me that this man, he gets off the throne. I can see him throw that, that crown to the side. He, he rends his clothes, gets down. He knows there's trouble in the camp now. I don't know how. Naaman must have been in town this day. Or rather Elisha. Not the word against Elisha. The king down over there. I mean, he's all been out of shape. Things going wrong for him. What's wrong with him? Well, he got a letter today in the, from Naaman, a man down from Syria. Wants this man to cure him of leprosy. No, Elisha didn't get all been out of shape. He just said, send him to my house. Just send him on over to my house. I believe the church ought to be a healing station. How to be this ought to be a soul saving station. I believe this ought to be a place where people are set free from every sickness and disease. It ought to be it's okay. I, 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 I'm gonna have a little trouble with this now. I, I, it's okay to have a handicap parking outside. It's okay to have a handicap rail coming up beside the church for for people to hold on to to get in the church. But all in order to be when we roll them in in a wheelchair, that they can push the wheelchair out. Let them walk up the handicap ramp. But oh God, let them walk down the stairs. Let them park in the handicap when they come. But let them park in another space in the parking lot the next time they come back to church again. I believe there's a cure, my friend. I I'm preaching to you something that I believe over with all of my heart. I, I, I can tell something you don't really believe that. Elisha said, send him to my house. I wonder how many of us would have done that. You know, here's us. Well, I tell you what. I'll give him my doctor's telephone number. I'll send him, send him over there. You know? Boy, I got me a bottle of pills here. You talking about the power for this? I'll knock it out of you. These things are good. That's us today, the church, you know. We got a cure. Well, I mean, I went to one the other day. He just, I mean, sis, he helped me out. He done me real good. I really like him. He's real friendly, and he just, I like he really cares. And, and you ought to try him. I believe he'll do you a lot of good. But I should have sent him nowhere, but he said, tell him to come over to my house. Have you got some kind of hocus pocus there? No, sir. Have you got some kind of potion in under the cabinet? No, sir. I know in whom I believe. I know the God of Israel. I know the one that can do anything. There's never been a leper cleansed. The Bible don't tell about one leper being cleansed. But here this man dares to believe there's a cure for leprosy. I, I, I know that king glad to hear that. Send him to my house. That, that's good. You get him out here. He's sure glad to get that guy out of his place. Naaman gets in that chariot the way he goes. He got them serpents. Go over to a certain, certain avenue. Go call, turn to the left here by this tree. Go out there. I can just picture old brother Elisha living, you know, out in the country somewhere. All by himself out there. He's sitting up there in an easy chair, you know. Just getting along real good. And then Mr. Naaman drives up out front. The Bible says that Naaman comes to the door. Elisha looks at the door. Yeah, that's, that's him. It must be the fellow got leprosy. Yeah, that's him. I can see him. Come to the door. Knock on the door. Elisha said, go, go to the door. Man. Just tell that fellow going down to the Jordan dip seven times. Come on now. Just go down to Jordan and, and, and dip seven times. Now, here's some of us folks, you know. What if you'd been in that service, sister? I wonder if you would have told him. Fella, I don't know about this now, but this is what that fella in the house said. He said, if you'll go down to Jordan, that's that way, and dip seven times in that muddy Jordan, you'll be healed. <laughs> you know, never happened before. Now, you can believe if you want to. I don't know if it'll really work or not. That's right. We've got folks who quote scripture and then say, here, take ten of these. I 
I've listened to people's conversation. We get down and pray. Oh, God, heal them. Get back to the car. Here, let's take them on to the doctor now. Why are you so quiet? You know, a few nights ago, you was wanting to swing from the lights. I'm still preaching out of the same Bible. I ain't changed. Still the same Bible. This one right here, same book. Elisha said, go down and dip seven times. That's what the servant said. You got folks in the church would have never told him. Had never told that name and that. But this servant told him, go down there and dip seven times and you will be made whole. Here you go. You got, here's the church folks now. Here's some of these other church folks now. This, this fellow, he's standing at the door. Mr. Naaman's standing there. He, he's waiting on some kind of hocus pocus deal. And it don't happen. And he says to that servant, I can see him against mad. The Bible said he was wrong. And he went away in an anger. He was upset because he didn't hear what he wanted to hear. Elisha, he's still sitting in the chair. He ain't moved yet. And the servant standing there, he getting blessed out. He said, I thought he'd come out here and wave his hand over me. I, I thought he'd come out of the house and tell me my telephone number. I thought, sure, Mr. Mr. Lye should come out here and tell me how many doctors I got or how many children I got. And I, I thought, sure, he was going to come out here and, and just say some hocus pocus and wave his hand over me and before everything going to change, I'll jump back in the chair and go back to the house. The Bible said he said, I thought. Not this, where a lot of folks go wrong in the church. I thought. I thought this, and I thought that. And because they didn't go the way they thought, they do just like old Naaman said. He said to this service, get this horse, get him geared up, and get out of here. Money, I was going to pay that fella. He brought, it, the value of what he brought was over $75,000. You got some silly folks today trying to buy it. That's right. I said, you got some silly folks trying to buy this thing. That's right, trying to pay for it. You can't pay for it. It's already paid for. I said, it's already paid for at Calvary. That, that whipping post, Jesus Christ paid the price for us. Naaman goes away. He's wrong. He's upset. He's angry because Elisha don't tell him what he wants to hear. And he goes for some distance. And somehow one of those servants finally gets up the gall to say, Naaman, you know, he didn't ask you to do something hard. He just asked you to go down to the Jordan dip seven times. Now, the way we got this thing figured, if he had asked you to done something hard, you'd done it. Yes, sir, buddy, you'd been over getting it done. But it just don't seem like to us. You know, it ain't none of our business because you, you're the leper, but, you know, we're just trying to look at this thing through the eyes of, of human being here. I'm coming up to the point why some folks don't get made whole. I'm coming up to the point why some folks don't get the Holy Ghost but when God says the Holy Ghost is for them. This man's angry, upset. He's going away in a rage. He's going the wrong direction. Jordan's that way. I ain't going to Jordan. I'm going to Syria. Well, go on then. Go on and die leper. If you want to be cured, you're going to Jordan. I ain't a going. I'll go to a banner. You'll die there. We got two rivers in Damascus, far apart in a banner. They're crystal clear. That old Jordan River, it's dirty and muddy. But I want to tell you, mister, the rivers that flow through your country, it's flowing through a heathen country. This river flows through God's country. It's God's river. You see what Mr. Naaman had? He had pride. Man, I'm, in, I'm running this show. Yes, sir. I'm the ones in control here. I, 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 I'm Mr. Naaman. I'm an honorable man. Everybody knows me when I pull in town. Yeah, you're a leper too. Yes, sir, you're a leper too, mister. 
And if you don't turn that buggy around, you're going to die, leper. So Mr. Pride had to get down off his throne. Mr. Pride had to become humble. And the same fellow by the lines that told him, go to Syria, had to tell him, turn the buggy around and go to Jordan. And it was hard for him to do it. And there's many times in the church, some people are not willing to admit they're wrong, they're failed. And they don't keep them from receiving the blessings of God. I wasted a lot of good oil on folks. Oh, yeah, I have. I've wasted some good oil. I've wasted some stinking oil, too. Yes, sir. Like laying your hand on that wall over there. Me praying, do the best I know how. Done, done prayed and fasted, sought God. Come out of my prayer closet of hours and then get somebody that something wrong in their life, but yet they don't want anybody to know it. They think God don't care or is concerned and wants you to pray a blessing down on them. I can't do it. And I sure could have not have made him whole until that man obeyed God's voice through Elisha. Go to Jordan, dip seven times, ain't a going. We'll die then. All I should didn't run out of the house. Say, come back here. I'm sorry I offended you. I'll take all that gold. You get some of them, their, their letters in the mail today, you know, some kind of, of string or some, some silly stuff. All they're doing is trying to sell it. That's all it is. You can believe if you want to, but that's a, that's a silly mess that, that's got in that church. Send me, I'll send you a cord, a piece of rope. I send you a piece of bark. All kind of stuff. And you know who the most gullible people is? The Pentecostal folks. That's who it is, the Pentecostal. They're the ones that eat that stuff up. Boy, I'm, I'm going over there, man. I'm going to send him $50 and I, I'm going to get my blessed plan. Here this man had to tell them service, turn the buggy around. You go to Jordan, and I, I you know, here he goes. He, he finally calmed down. And, boy, this has really offended me and hurt me that I had to tell them to do that. You know, it's amazing how God uses certain folks sometimes to get your attention about some things. Use that little Jewish maid. Now he's going to use the river of Jordan. I personally believe the healing was not in the water. I believe it was in obedience. And God had to deal with Mr. Pride. Some folks don't get the Holy Ghost because they're full of pride. Got a $25 hairdo and don't want you to mess it up. I mean, I, I got a lot of time involved in this. Don't, don't wrinkle my clothes. You ain't going to get nowhere with God until it don't matter what or who's praying for you. You got some folks that want other folks. I don't, boy, don't pray for me. You ain't going to get nothing out of order. You got to get that and it don't matter who prays for you, who, who lays hands on you, who's around you. You got your mind on worship and praise and, and magnifying God. I'm dealing with that question. Why is it that some folks don't receive them, God, that, that that book said is theirs. All right, here we go. You better buckle up, because this is what God gave me. The reason some folks not made whole because they're sympathy seekers. They don't want to be made whole. That's hard to believe. But I can tell you that's the truth. Some folks don't want to, they don't want you to pray for them because they like to be prayed for. They want you to ask, ask them, how you doing? Sometimes that's a terrible mistake to ask. They'll tell you every sickness and disease they had for the last 50 years. Want to show you every scar that they got when it's in the hospital causing an operation. 
Yes, sir. There are some God said they're not healed because they don't want to be healed. They're sympathy seekers. Then you got them other folks. God's getting tired of people treating him like, like he's a, 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 a pill in a bottle. You know, they got a mantle over there. Got all kinds of, of, of chem or a bottle sitting there. They got one for discouragement, one for sickness, and one for this. And, and just whenever they need God, they think they can run over there and, and take the top off, pop a pill, and everything's all right now. And then live like the devil, do like they want to do. No, sir. God don't heal you a lung cancer so you can keep on sucking on cigarettes. God don't heal you and your legs being crippled so you can go to the dance hall. God don't heal your eyes so you can look at the filth and the garbage of this world. That Bible said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if, that's a big word, if, that means the power of decisions in it, if my people, not the world, no, no, I'm talking about folks. Oh, God, bad mistake here. No, I'm talking about people. Israel, yeah, Israel. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. There's Mr. Naaman. Shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. Then and only then. You need not go any further. You can pray all you want to. You can talk in tongues all you want to talk in tongues. Pour all the oil you want to pour on them. But he said, if my people which you call by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn and turn and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal here from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. And that same principle carries over into that New Testament, into that day and generation of grace. You will you come out from among that world. You'll separate yourself, or you'll not receive the promises of God. Now go ahead and get puffed up. You got some folks don't want you putting no oil on them. I personally believe there's no more healing in that ball of oil than was in River Jordan. But God in his omnipotent omniscience, he himself, in that book in James, the book of James, chapter 5, verse 14, he said, James asked the question, is any sick among you? Who is he talking to? The church? Is any sick among you? Any, any. He didn't say this kind or that kind. Is any kind of sickness among you? He said to them, people, call for the elders of the church. Let the elders pray for them. Let them anoint them with oil. Somebody pray the prayer of faith. The Lord shall save them. He'll raise them up. And the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. He didn't stop there, though. I mean, in the same breath, James still talking. He said to them same folks that are sick that call for the elders of the church, when the elders have done their part, when they have anointed them with them all, John, uh, James said for them same people, he said to confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. For him to say that, Brother Anderson, means that there are some people will not be healed after they call for the elders, after they have anointed them with with all, after they prayed the prayer of faith, that they will not be healed because they themselves have some kind of sin in their heart, in their mind. They have all against their brother, and he said they will not be healed. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said the principle before he ever left here on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you come down to the altar, you bring your gift, and your brother has it all against you, he didn't say put that, that gift on the altar. Leave, leave it before the altar. Get up, go to that brother, make things right. When everything's right between you on that side and you on this side, everything's right. He said, come back, get the gift up, put it on the altar, and then your prayers will be answered. I pray for some of them kind of folks. I mean, they's mad with somebody else and then want me to pray God to heal them or do something this, give them this or that. I knew, I knew they ain't getting nowhere. 
ain't getting nowhere until things are right. If you use that aisle for anything but to, but just to get you in and out of here to shout him, then you're using it for the wrong thing, fella. Hello now. I said you're using it for the wrong thing. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, Paul was dealing with the church at Corinth. Them folks said, we don't come behind in no gifts, fella. I mean, we the leaders around here. We are them spiritual folks. But they come to the place that they was eating the Lord's Supper, and they made a party out of it. And Paul said, you better examine yourself. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Paul said, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and sleep. He was talking to the church. He was talking to a church that said, we don't come behind in nothing. But Paul said, I want to show you, you got some problems in your midst. They're the reason some of you are weak in body and you're sick and some of you already died is because you don't think of the Lord's Supper as it ought to be thought of. So you'll walk, you'll walk up there. You'll take that bread, represent the body of Christ that was broken for you. You'll take that juice that represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you. And you'll take it down and, and you don't think anything about it. Paul said, you better examine yourself before you ever do it. You better search your heart. No, don't look at your sister. Don't look at your brother. No, no, don't look at the preacher. Don't look at nobody else. You look at self. Because what you're about to do is a very sacred thing. It's, it's God ordained. God himself set that sacrament in order. And when you come to a place, you take it light day and you got sin in your life. You're going to suffer the consequences thereof. We like to quote Isaiah 59 and verse 1. God said there, and Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Well, we can jump and shout, My God! He's on the phone. He knows everything. He's in control. But God said, But your iniquities have separate, separated between you and me, and your sins have hid my face from you, and I will not hear you. Talking to God's people, he said, because of your sin, I no longer hear your voice. But I'm still a church member. I, I, I've been baptized. I'm still on the church row. I'm doing pretty good in church attendance and time in God. But he said, your sins have hid my face from you. Well, I got another one. First Peter chapter 3. Peter dealt with the situation at church. He said, now husbands, you to honor that wife. You, you are to honor her. She, she's your help meet. You, you are to honor her. You're not to be a lord over her and be and frown on her. And he said, also wives, come on now. Right here is where some of you going to get puffed up. Especially, you know, if you got anybody here tonight that's, you know, they want to be the boss. Whew. You know, I like to see humble people. I do. Oh, it, it, it just, it, it's kind of gagging to me. You know, see a big old man, a little old woman here, and, and she tell him to jump. He jump and say, how high on the way up? You know. She lead him around by wringing his nose, you know. Just whatever she says, that's it, buddy. I mean, don't matter if it's, oh, some of you are really looking at me mean now. But that Bible said, Peter said to that church, husbands, you honor that wife, and wife, you being subjected to your husband. That don't mean that you've got to go to the honky-tonk with him if he's a sinner and you're a saint. That's not what he's saying. The laws of God come before all the laws of man. But when it comes down to it, yes, sir, if he's, he, he's doing right, then mister, you or sister, you are to be in subjection to him. Paul said in his writing, in all things. You know why a lot of families in the shape of the end? God has, God has a set plan. When you break that plan in any way, it throws everything out of kilter. God the Father, the Son is in subjection to God the Father. I'm doing His will. He said, I purchased that church. I'm the head of that church. The church is being subjected to Christ. 
when you break that, it, everything goes haywire. He said, not only that, I'll give you an example. That husband, he used to be in subjection to Christ as Christ is subjected to God the Father. And as the husband is subjected to Christ, the wife is to be subjected to that husband. The children are to obey their parents. And when you get into one of them out of order, the whole thing goes haywire. You get children that don't obey their parents, then it's a mess. You, you get a wife that don't want to be in subjection to her husband as a leader of that home, then it causes them children to be the same way. It'll throw the thing out of order. What's wrong with you folks now? I don't mean you're the beaten family. That ain't what I'm saying. But we have an awesome responsibility, Brother Anderson. You're to be the priest of your home. You ought to be the prophet in your home. You ought to be the leader in your home. God tell you responsible. And Sister Anderson, I'm just using you an example. If you ever try to get out of that position, it'll throw everything in a mess. I don't mean just when the kids are home either. That means... Till you die. That's God's plan. Well, I can see right now I'm killing this thing. You know when submission is tested? I was down in prayer one day. God showed me when submission is tested. It's when your will is crossed. That's the only way you know that you're in subjection. Submission is when your will is crossed. When it don't go according to your will, then the real test has come. Am I in submission to God? And I've seen that with some children, you know. And parents don't tell them what they want. And all they can throw a tamper. I, I mean, just carry on. I had a cousin, she'd beat her head on the floor. That's right, I had another one. She'd just lose her breath. Just hold her breath. Turn blue. But old, old Brother Solomon had the cure for all that over in Proverbs. He said, you know, you take that rod. Yes, sir, that'll cure that. I know what this silly mess is today. You give them a complex. No, you'll give them a hot seat. That's right. You get their attention. You say, listen here, boy. Girl, I, I, I'm running this show, not you. But you know, I, I watched parents, that little kid coming. Dad, I want this, I want that. No, you ain't going to have it. They're going to, ah! Okay, 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 okay. Some of you, some of you ladies go ahead and laugh. I've seen some of you do the same thing. Yes, sir. I want this. Don't get it. I ain't cooking your supper. I ain't fixing you nothing. You, you iron your own clothes. You sleep on the couch. Thank God, but just a few more nights, this ain't going to be over. I'm telling you the reason that some people are not made whole. Now, you may think these things are not important, but they, God said to me, they are important. I've had that devil brother McHugh, he's wallowed me around and said, boy, you ain't nothing. You ain't no, sir, your prayers don't mean nothing. That fasting don't mean anything. That prayer life don't mean nothing. If it had a why didn't this happen? And God showed me, it's not always you, preacher. Many times, it's the one you are praying for. You still with me, brother? All right. Peter said, if that husband don't honor her wife, honor his wife, that wife don't be subjected to her husband, then their prayers will be hindered. Well, I just go to Tonsa then and get him to pray for me. Go ahead. It's still hold, the same principle holds true in Tonsa as it does in McClinney. You don't have to go to Miracle Valley to get a miracle from God. There is no miracle valley. A miracle is at hand every time you live for God and serve God. Well, I didn't run out of time. I don't believe somebody can take any more of this. Yes, sir, the reason some folks are not healed is because they don't have any faith. 
God said have faith in God. He didn't say have faith in the preacher. He didn't say have faith in the oil. He said have faith in God. There's some things not going to happen to you pray and fast. Jim Tyson said, why couldn't we do that? We've done it before. He, called, he said, this kind cometh not but by prayer and fasting. Yes, sir. Because they, they did not pray and fast, unbelief come in. It got a hold to them. And they saw that boy wallowing around, foaming at the mouth, the devil trying to kill him. And they couldn't have faith. Oh, you better be full of faith or you'll get to the house of God. I can tell you, them folks come to Jesus, try to put it on him. He'll say, oh, sir, it's according to your faith. Yes, he did. Now, no, don't you try to put it on me. It's according to your faith. Well, I didn't feel no goosebumps. It's according to your faith. I didn't fall in the floor. It's according to your faith. I've seen God put some folks in the floor. I don't believe he just puts you down there to let you take a nap or something. No. I, I believe when he puts you down there, he does it for a reason. I've seen God heal people. Them get up, go feel good about it, and say, well, I thank God for blessing me. I believe God done something for you. I believe there was a miracle took place. He didn't fall through your body. Oh, but you get up and say, oh, I thank God for touching me. Why don't you go ahead and confess it? Confess the word of God and you'll not be saying a lie. Confess I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I've seen in my ministry two dead folks get up. So I've never seen that. I've seen two dead folks get up and walk and be dead. Both of them in the church house. Now Smith Wigglesworth prayed that prayer of faith for that fellow. He had no feet. And he forgot to be praying. He still had no feet. He went to that shoe store the next day. He put faith into action. Them feet grow there. Yes, sir. I mean, a foot grew on that nub. We stuck that nub in the shoe. In the 1900s, it happened. In, 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 in Cuba. In Cuba now. There's a man there. God sent him back from Puerto Rico. He's having revival. And people's arms are literally growing on them. He said, oh, man, I don't believe that. That's your problem. Seeing this, believing. You doubt you'll do without. Oh, yeah. But that Bible said he come to heal all manner of sickness and disease. And I refuse to let anybody make me believe any different. I refuse to doubt that there's nothing that God cannot do. But if he can bring us to the place that we believe that simple childlike faith. You examine yourself. You make sure there's no all against your brother. You make sure there's no bitterness or anger there. No malice or strife. No envy. I believe you're a candidate to be made whole. Yes, sir, the devil's going to fight you. He's going to do everything he can putting it in your mind to stop you. And if there's ever been a time that a sick person needs a church because when a person is sick, it's hard for them to believe. That's why James said, call for the elders of the church. They need to be the ones out of the prayer of faith prayed because the sick person can hardly do it then. You ain't going to have time to run out there and fast three days in. You ain't going to have time to run over there and make something right then. No, sir, you better have everything right when they call for you. When James said, confess your faults to one another, he was talking to the elders. He didn't mean run over and talk to some long tongue, go get on the phone, spread it across town. No, no. No, he didn't say that. He said, you, you, you confess it to them elders. And ones that are going to pray for you, confess to them, I, I've done wrong. I've talked about you, brother. I've really run that. I, I run the pianist down. I just didn't care for my Sunday school teacher. That preacher made me mad. You confess your faults. James said, you can be made whole then. You can be healed. I'm going to live by that right there, what I'm preaching. I'm going to live by it because I believe it's the gospel truth that Jesus Christ come to make people well. He come to fill people with the Holy Ghost and with fire to sanctify you holy. But you got to want it. 
You've got to do anything and everything that there is in your power to get that done. And then God will do the part you cannot do. He'll do the healing. Stand to your feet with me. If there's something that you need God to do in your life, I want you to come and kneel at this altar. Come on. If, there's, if, it's, if it's to be healed, it's to be sanctified, to be saved, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, it, it, whatever it is, I want you to come and kneel. Examine yourself. And then the church is going to pray, pray, we're going to pray. I believe God's going to do the work. Devil, you're defeated. Victory is ours.